Well, a lot of Christians out there have a different take on that. <laughs> well, but that's that's well, this is the problem. The rabbi know this, so you know they've sold the lies and they laugh. That's why they laugh because people are sold a lie and believe it. But the red symbolizes the Talmud covenant. So whenever you see the numbers in red, it's back to the primary primary covenant. Yeah. By, by the way, if I could just interject there, Vic, do you know about the United States Public Law 102-14? Uh, not off the cuff. I read a lot of them, but uh, quite a while ago. Okay, that one is entitled the Education Act. It was passed okay. in 1991 by the Bush. Okay. Anyway, uh, it declares that all U.S. law is based on the Talmud. Is that news to you? Uh, no, it's not actually. Oh. Any, anyway, it goes on to say that um, <clears throat> it's an education that the Talmudic or the, uh, the uh, Noahide laws, the seven Noahide laws, are to be applied to Gentiles in the United States. Right. It doesn't explain what the punishment is for violating the Noahide laws, but it makes a statement. You can find it on the internet. 102-14. Uh, anyway, so it, it uh, what it's doing is it's getting back to the. Uh, to the Talmudic jurisdiction right. uh, with, the, with the original blood oath and that's where the first covenant uh, that's where the first covenant uh, is at and they do <laughs> they always, do have jurisdiction they do right yeah, my dad always said the Talmud's not a good book for us <laughs> no, but the, the, the interesting thing and this is something I was saying to, to Gerald and I've said to the, to the guys Vic is that um when you hear the word covenant, what they don't tell you is that um, you know covenant is a is a binding agreement, so it's a contract. It's a binding contract, yep. um, and you cannot enter a contract. You know, under the oldest laws, so go back to Hammurabi, Rome, all these laws, you cannot enter a contract unless it's a contract of equals, right? Yes. So what they t they teach um, Christians is that they say that there's a sacred contract, right? But they don't teach Christians that you can't enter a contract unless you're equal. So, right, so when, when a covenant is claimed and it cannot be demonstrated as equal, then it can't be a valid covenant. It's a false, it's a false covenant, right? It's a false binding agreement. Now, the most famous passage of the Talmud, and you've probably heard this, is when the rabbi argued with God and won. Have you ever heard of that argument? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, well, it, you probably might have heard of it, but it, it not, maybe not the quote, but it's, there's, a, there's a famous passage by the founder of the, of the, the, the kingdom of Israel and the founder of the covenant um, under one of his various pseudonyms where it says that the rabbi argued with God, in this case it's with Moloch, Satan, and won the argument. So the passage is, is probably one of the most esoteric of the Talmud. It's regarded as one of the most important of the Talmud, but its, it's reason for existence is the argument is one of jurisdiction and what, why they, they claim that the covenant with Moloch is valid is that under this argument, the rabbi argued that if they demonstrate such evil upon the earth, well, they didn't publish this, but this is the effect of it. If they, if they unleash such evil upon the earth and establish rule upon the earth as judges of the earth, then they are equal to Moloch in the underworld. Right. Gotcha. So it's a valid covenant in their eye so long yeah. as they continue to perform evil and right. sacrifice. Right? Okay, so that explains a lot right there, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But there was a there was a maturing agreement in the covenant, which was uh, at, the, at the end of the covenant, uh, or at a, at a point of time in the covenant, that they, these are the rabbinical um, Zionist crew, have to sacrifice themselves. And of course they haven't. Instead, what we see 
is in the 20th century, which was sign signified as, as the, if you like, the maturing of the, this covenant, yep. they substituted others instead of themselves. Uh, that would sound about the way they would do things now, doesn't it? <laughs> right. And the figure, that was, the figure that was interpreted by their most senior rabbi in sacrifice of themselves, which they used as a substitute, was the figure six million. Six million? Six million. They interpreted that from from the uh, from their uh, prophecy that they had to sacrifice six million of their own in order to remain in honour with the covenant. Now, people think of the figure six million in World War Two, of course, right? Yep. yep. But uh, in fact, they tried it in World War One first, and it didn't wash. They claimed that six million Jewish German uh, soldiers who'd been killed in World War One, and uh, they made big, uh, uh, big announcements in New York about it, and people just said it was just all propaganda and crap. So they decided not to push it any further. Um, but uh, the figure was very strongly pushed in um, in uh, after World War Two to say that six million uh, Jews had been um, uh, murdered. Um, in the Holocaust, right? Uh, when, when, now um, the, when, the one thing to are, put in in there, Frank, uh, is this: um, uh, uh, Vic, do you know what the word Holocaust means? Uh, not, I have never looked into it, so I'm going to. It means it a, means a burnt sacrificial offering to a god, and if, uh, of animals. Yeah. And what did Hitler do? Allegedly, right? Burnt them all. Well. Um, the sacrifices to Baal Moloch yeah, were going they, on they, they 2,000 years ago. Burned, um, the company Bayer that created the... Yeah. Yeah. The way they accomplished that. Hmm? What does it mean? Once they accomplished that. Well, two things. Um, one... Um, from the time of um, the Roman cult popes that were Venetian, that were burning people like the Cathars, uh, they were getting prophecy out of them when they were burning them. Yes. Uh, and secondly, uh, when they burn them, um, it's such an excruciating way to die that the, the soul is then um, given up um, to Moloch. So it becomes part of the energy of Moloch. Ah. And that would make Moloch happy now, wouldn't it? Well, turns out not really. <laughs> turns out not really. <laughs> well, yeah, in the sense that, well, okay, I mean, the, while the, the uh, yeah, the, the problem with um, sure, Charlie, yeah, anyone would want to come on, absolutely. Um, the, the the challenge for them is that um, their cosmology is extremely, extremely basic, yeah? For example, they recognize that there has been supernatural forces in existence for a long time, but it's never really occurred to them where those spiritual forces come from, Right. yeah? Yes. So if you have a superhuman spirit, where did it come from? Was it made out of energy? Was it because of the collective belief? Was it because some um, alien had existed prior to to the to the um, Samaritans? We call them Samaritans. Yes. Um, also, we call them Venetians. We also call them Phoenicians. We also call them Carthaginians. Um, we also call them um, uh, a number of other things. But uh, to these people, they didn't really care. That's just not their interest. Their interest was. How do we establish an argument of power? They weren't really into, you know, anything deeper than that. Their cosmology has always been shallow power. They're traders. Right. You know, to them, it was all about uh, argument, legalese, position and control. It was never about completion, um, synergy. Um, they're into prophecy, but that, again, it shows how shallow they are. They would rather be told something from a dying man or woman on a stake than spend 20 years studying history to come up with something themselves. Yeah? Right. 
Yep. So it's a real mindset of these people. Uh, and that's why they build their big houses and have parties and, you know, take drugs because really to them, um, uh, it's all the short path, Vic. It's not the long path, it's the short path. Yeah? Yeah, but the, but at the end of the day, I don't think they're right. <clears throat> I think they're, de they're delaying the inevitable. That's something I read. Uh, there's basically two types of souls, if you will, simultaneous and sequentials. And the sequentials believe that they can extend their lives, you know, gain everlasting life, pardon me, everlasting life from drugs and things like this. Rather than looking at it from the spiritual perspective, they don't see that yet. They haven't caught on to that. That's my, that's, that's my right. take, <laughs> understanding of it. Uh, well, well it, excuse yeah, me it, one it, second. Charlie. I just brought two people onto the call, uh, Tim and Berkeley. They just joined in with us. Long time no talk to Tim. Hello. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and finish the conversation. I just wanted to now stay we're on the call. No, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, look, I think it's um, in all of this. It's it's um, you know, Sensu, Sensei. You know, a lot of stuff gets spoken about uh, Chinese war philosophy. But I think one truth is to know thy enemy is extremely important. And it's one of the big missing pieces in in moving forward and truth movement is not a full appreciation of uh, walking in the shoes and understanding the mind of the enemy. Um, and I think that's why, uh, sadly, a lot of uh, actions are uh, are done without full effect. Like the Jesuits, for example, people not, people not understanding who the Jesuits are, or the Roman cult. People thinking that they've been in power since uh, the time of uh, Peter, when in reality they only took power across the 11th century. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's there's a lot of things that are coming to fore now that become tools that we can use to physically address, uh, tackle, position, outposition these people. Um, I just mentioned one then, the Roman cult. You know, when I describe the um, the takeover by the Lombardy pagan uh, satanic families uh, that used the Pontifex Maximus title and uh, and their their history to kind of opposition the the Franks and the Saxons that uh, gave life back to Rome to opposition in Constantinople, um, I call them the Roman cult. I don't call them the Roman Catholic Church because if you say the Catholic Church is corrupt, maybe in a room you might get three people that agree, but you're probably also going to get five people that are going to be quite upset because they're Catholic or they know someone who's Catholic and, and they don't feel it's fair to uh, to to basically um, slander everyone because of a few priests. But if you say Roman cult, you're not talking about a Catholic. You're talking about a very small group of people who know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, so hard to agree. So, and sorry. Yeah. No. No. It's it's just back to what we're saying before about understanding what happens in the in the court um, and the concept of how to establish standing immediately, clearly. Um, uh, you know, there's been thousands of well, not just thousands, but millions of words that have been produced on the internet about how to. Uh, tackle you know tax and other issues but in many cases it's it's about fluff about misdirection it's getting back to exactly what's going on so when we we're talking before vic about uh and what uh, what uh, gerald was showing is when you look at the the definitions that are in the legal dictionaries they tell you that um when you walk in uh one of the legal maxims is uh, one who who does not establish their rights has none. In other words, if you don't establish standing in court, you have no standing. Correct. They tell us. Um, and yet, you know, people still think that if they put paperwork into a, a clerk, that that is somehow to establish standing. It doesn't. You walk into the court, you know, you must stand and say, uh, Your Honour, I... Uh, I'm a living being. The flesh lives, the blood flows. Uh, and 
I ask humbly for, for remedy. The judge doesn't want to give you.